Welcome. Uh, my name is Brendan. I work for the Central Park Conservancy. I'm the Associate Director of Interpretation and Programs. Uh, the Conservancy, Conservancy is incredibly excited to partner with the Tenement Museum for this program. I just got an email. <laughs> uh, the program Urban Oasis, the movement for city parks. Really, especially in this moment in our history, uh, during a time when coronavirus is making us rethink our relationship with parks, but additionally, when our public spaces are being activated across the country as sites of protest and collective action. Uh, our program today will be about 45 minutes, and it's gonna focus on the history of city parks and playgrounds, how they came to be, their value, and how people have activated them throughout history. Uh, we'll begin with Marie Warsh, the Central Park Conservancy historian, and then follow up with Jacob Pueda, uh, education specialist for walking tours at the Tenement. Now, after the presentation, uh, Marie and Jacob will conclude with some final reflections and a brief panel discussion. And this is our first time trying a program like this, so if we have a few technical difficulties, just roll with it, because uh, we're going to. Uh, I wanted to give a quick overview of the Zoom controls, just in case this is your first time using the software. Uh, on the Zoom control bar, you're going to see a chat and a Q&A. In the chat, you're more than welcome to comment um, and say hello. And if you have a question, try using the Q&A. Now we have SJ Costello and Dolan Cochran from the Tenement Museum and Ryan Schmidt and Ian McGrath from the Conservancy on the back end, and they'll be answering your questions as we go. We hope to have live captioning for this program, but unfortunately we weren't able to make that happen today. Uh, but the program is being recorded and it will appear on the Tenement Museum and the Conservancy websites and it will have captions at that time. It would be great to learn how you heard about the program. Uh, so I'm going to pop up a poll on your screen real quick. There you go. So if you wouldn't mind just clicking a button and letting us know if you came to us through the Conservancy or through the Tenement Museum, uh, that would be greatly appreciated. All right. So I wanna go ahead and uh, get ourselves started. Uh, let's actually bring our panelists on and uh, let them introduce themselves and their respective institutions. So I will invite Jacob and Marie to go ahead and share their, uh, turn on their cameras, excuse me. Fantastic. Um, so uh, Marie, why don't you go ahead and just start and share a little bit um, about your role with the Conservancy and the Central Park Conservancy. Sure, hi everybody. Um, this is my first webinar and it's a little strange to be talking into this void in a way, but I'm really happy to be here. Um, as Brendan said, I'm the historian for the Central Park Conservancy. And um, what I do for the Conservancy is a lot of historic research for various purposes. I do research related to some of the restoration projects in the park and then also um, for public programs. And um, I write essays for our blog. Um, and one of the things that's so amazing about the park and its history is that um, there's so much to learn and it's not something anyone could ever kind of cover in a short time um, and you can get kind of stuck in it. So what I'm, I'm really pleased to be partnering with the Tenement Museum and to sort of get outside of Central Park a little bit and think a bit, little bit about the relationships between Central Park and other parks, which is really the focus of this talk. Um, the Central Park Conservancy is a nonprofit organization that restores and manages Central Park on, um, in partnership with the city. Um, and, you know, we've been doing a lot of public programs like tours, and obviously we're not doing those so much right now. So um, we've taken this opportunity to kind of do these online programs and, and really work with other organizations. Um, so, Jacob, do you want to? <laughs> Yeah, Get away, Jacob. I can definitely in the Museum. sympathize with those sentiments of talking to the void. Um, but no, my name is Jacob. I'm the education specialist for walking tours at the museum. I've been there about five years now, kind of beginning as an educator leading programs of uh, our two sort of historic tenement buildings built in the 1860s and 1880s. Uh, as education specialists or as specialists for walking tours, I sort of over I lead and do an overview of the the walking tour program so i train educators i write content certainly there's a lot of that happening now sort of digitally and virtually um the tenement museum itself tells the stories of immigrants migrants and refugees we do that specifically sort of through our two buildings recreating the spaces that these people called home 
sort of we would lead you through in pre-virus times showing you sort of the the places and spaces that these people lived in which i think is really sort of fun and fascinating because everyone has this idea and an image of a tenement in their head whether they live in one or sort of the the family legends that go with it and then we just sort of tried to expose people to that and the history of it too great um, thank you. So I'm going to welcome or welcome Marie to go ahead and uh, get the presentation started. I'll be back at the end. I'm going to turn off my camera and my mic. Uh, and um, fantastic. Okay. So this talk is going to be on the history of parks in New York City, but specifically the relationship between Central Park, which was built beginning in 1858, and the small parks on the Lower East Side that were built beginning in the early 1900s. I wanted just to start with some orientation. Um, these, this, the pins here are actually the locations of our respective institutions. So the green pin is the location of the Central Park Conservancy, which is on 60th Street near Fifth Avenue. And then the red pin is the Tenement Museum, which is on Orchard Street. Um, and this really also just helps us see the kind of geographic spread of our topic today um, and the sort of distance between these two areas. So I have a slide here on the left, we're seeing Central Park. And then on the right, we're seeing Seward Park. And I want to begin by talking about how parks and playgrounds are so ubiquitous in cities. I think it's sometimes easy to forget that when they were first created, they were extraordinarily innovative. Um, no one had ever seen spaces like this before. Um, and the two parks that we're talking about here um, are, really arguably, are really the most important for laying this foundation of parks being essential to the urban fabric and to the well-being of those living in cities. Central Park was built beginning in 1858, and then Seward Park on the Lower East Side was built beginning in 1903, and is notable for having the first municipally funded playground in the city. And so I'm gonna talk more about how these parks came to exist and how they influenced each other and their meaning today. When thinking about the origins of the parks, it's really important to emphasize that they're a distinctly urban phenomenon. Parks are a response to urban growth, and specifically to the fact that this growth, especially in the early days, was not really well planned. It was very organic. And when it was planned, there wasn't a lot of consideration for the need for open space and recreation. This is the city's grid plan. So this was the plan for the city's um, development in 1811, which was a very visionary plan, but it didn't really include very much open space. And that was in part because those who created it thought that there was open space, ample open space and fresh air along the waterfront, um, and that would be enough. But as we know, those areas were already filling up with industry and shipping. There were a few before Central Park, there were a few existing parks, uh, these squares that you see here that were scattered throughout downtown. But beginning in the 1840s, civic leaders and sanitary reformers became really concerned about public health and began to argue that these small squares were really inadequate and that what the city needed was a really large open space. And this was in part because of numerous disease outbreaks. We have limited time, so I'm not gonna go into all of the complexities of how Central Park came into being but because we are in the midst of a pandemic, I do wanna emphasize that public health was a huge motivation for the creation of parks in the 19th century. People hoped that a large area with fresh air, trees op and open space would provide a healthy alternative to the congestion and density of the city, which especially in the first half of the 19th century was subject to numerous disease outbreaks. Um, and this is an image here that's part of um, a series of illustrations documenting the cholera epidemic um, in the 1830s um, and showing that, you know, which was caused by lack of clean water. 
Um, and this caption here shows that there's not even any water um, in this in this neighborhood. And you know, this epidemic is really what led to the creation of our water supply system, the Croton Aqueduct system, which brought fresh water from upstate New York. Um, into the city. Um, and this is, history is very much tied up with the history of Central Park in the fact that both were really considered public health infrastructure. So like the water system, Central Park was really considered part of um, a way to benefit urban dwellers' public health. So the city decides to build a park and allocates a huge area for for this. Initially, it was around 790 acres. It was later expanded to 843, which is what it is now. And they hold a competition for its design, which was won by Frederick Law Olmsted and Calvert Vox, who are seen here, along with their plan, which was called Greensward. And again, I'm not going to get into too much detail about their, the specifics of their plan. I'm going to talk more about sort of the, pur the purpose um, and then talk a little bit about some of the details. Um, but they were really envisioning this sprawling park as a series of landscapes connected by different types of pathways, containing water bodies, containing um, bridges, often connecting them. Um, and then in the center, what you see are the two reservoirs, which were a key part of the water supply system. Um, and here's the park as it was built. And you really see the sort of contrast between the streets, the street grid, and um, the design of the park as this much more kind of curvilinear type of, of space. So in many documents, they clearly articulated the purpose of the park. So this was such an unprecedented thing. No one had ever seen a park like this or built a park like this. So they really had to explain what it was. And I think this is one of the, the best descriptions of the purpose of Central Park. And I'll just read it. The primary pur purpose of the park is to provide the best practical means of healthful recreation for the inhabitants of the city of all classes. It should have an aspect of spaciousness and tranquility with variety and intricacy of arrangement, therefore affording the most agreeable contrast to the confinement, bustle, and monotonous street division of the city. So one of the most important things they're saying here is that the park should provide this utmost contrast from the experience of the city. And how did they achieve this contrast? They created this series of landscapes and really what they created was this idealized version of the country right in the center of the city so that you would walk into the park and you would immediately feel that you were transported into the countryside and you would feel immediately this sense of relief. Um, and that was really what they wanted to achieve. They talked about how the beauty of the park should be the beauty of the fields, the meadow, the prairie of the green pastures and the still waters. What we want to gain is tranquility and rest to the mind. One of the most um, successful ways that this was achieved, the sense of tranquility and rest to the mind, was in landscapes that were re kind of recreations of upstate New York is what they were intended. Places like the Ramble in the center of the park, and the North Woods in the northern part of the park, you know, this is where you really could shut out the city. It's a place you can even shut out the city today. It's pretty remarkable. And they were really modeled after um, places like the Catskills and the Adirondacks. And again, this was sort of intentional. Um, and this is another quote where they're trying to articulate well, um, the purpose of the park. And, and Olmsted and Vox talk about how it was really to supply to the hundreds of thousands of tired workers who have no opportunity to spend their summers in the country, a specimen of God's handiwork that shall be to them inexpensively what a month or two in the White Mountains or the Adirondacks is a great cost to those in easier circumstances. So really the park was a place for people to take a summer vacation if they couldn't afford to go farther away. The park was also really a gathering space. So it was again about tranquility and rest and escape, but it was also a place for people to come together and congregate um, and also experience art and culture. Uh, this is an image of the mall that shows, um, which was really the premier, one of the premier gathering spaces in the park. And so the idea too, is that you were coming together with your fellow citizens 
and in this really beautiful and uplifting environment. So the park was a huge success and inspired the creation of similar parks throughout the city, but there were um, criticisms and, and sort of issues that had came up in the creation of, again, what was this very unprecedented um, place. So one of the critiques was that there were too many rules. And here you see a cartoon satirizing this with some sad looking children seeming at a loss of something that they really wanna do. Um, you'll see a lot of the signs in this cartoon say keep off the grass and that's something that did um, was often criticized that people weren't allowed to go on the lawns as much as they want to I think that they were open on Saturdays but for the rest of the time the idea was that you were really to, to look at the lawn and in looking at the lawn that would kind of give you um, a sense of peace and and you would enjoy the beauty of, of the meadow or the landscape they did have a lawn that was allocated for um, games such as baseball, um, but it was limited to children. And this was sort of controversial. There were lots of people playing baseball at the time and they wanted to use the park to do this. But the administrators of the park decided that that would be too disruptive. And so this is again, one of the challenges that, that comes about. Um, there really weren't accommodations for a lot of active sports that were gaining in popularity. There were activities such as ice skating and boating, but Olmsted and Vox and others argued that if the park was made to accommodate all potential activities, it could not serve its purpose as a respite from the city. Another complexity was that even though ideally the park and the purpose of the park was a place for all classes to come together, the park's location in what was pretty remote and in especially when it was first built made it difficult for all classes to access um, there are descriptions of different classes visiting the park in newspapers and guidebooks and in olmsted's writing so people did you know make it there but it was much more accessible to those who lived nearby and who could afford the time and cost of a horse car ride up north or a carriage of their own And this is a map from 1879 showing that even by this time, um, the areas around Central Park were not even that densely populated yet. So Central Park for a long time was a destination. It was not a neighborhood park. So there were a couple of attempts to kind of address this. Um, what's interesting is that in Prospect Park, which Olmsted and Vox designed next, they actually put this a large space for active recreation, you'll see on the left side of the park and kept it separate from the rest of the park so that it wouldn't infringe on the experience of landscape that they wanted people to have. But it still accommodated all of these things that um, could happen then. And they have this realization that the creation of these parks is a real balancing act. And it's never been done before in such a large and diverse city. And then beginning around the turn of the century, cities begin to build small parks located in some of the densely populated neighborhoods downtown. And this small parks movement is what Jacob is really gonna focus on um, next, but I wanted to introduce it a little bit here. This is a postcard showing um, what was then called Mulberry Bend Park. Um, it's now called Columbus Park located in Chinatown. And then as you'll see at the top, it was also called Paradise Park which is, is an amazing name for a park. And, and that was because advocates for creating this park, including people like the reformer and photographer, Jacob Reese, presented it as the utmost oasis from the surrounding city, which was really you know, building on the idea of, of Central Park as well. But as you see here, it's obviously much smaller and it's much more integrated and accessible to the surrounding neighborhood. Also want to introduce a little bit the playground movement, which Jacob is going to talk about much more. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the impact of the playground movement in Central Park. So before this period where playgrounds, as we know them today, in the sense of a separate contained space for children's play with equipment, the word was used in a more general sense as a ground for play. Um, so you'll see here in the caption of this photograph, which does show the baseball field in Central Park, 
um, Central Park is called the People's Playground. Um, so it, it's being used in this more general sense in the 19th century, and then that changes quite a bit in the 20th century. And playgrounds are really invented in response to grave concerns about the health of children, um, and particularly children living in these increasingly crowded and dense immigrant neighborhoods downtown, um, and their lack of access to spaces for play. And so advocates for playground often showed photos like this that showed children playing in the street and really argued for all of the danger, against all of the dangers that this posed for children. And that was a big impetus for creating these designated spaces that had fences around them, that had supervisors, and that were places where these children could not only exercise, but um, also be educated. And this is again the photograph of, of um, Seward Park that shows um, what was the first municipally funded playground in New York City. Uh, so this is the first time the city decided to create specifically um, these spaces for children's play. And you'll see in the center here, this was actually a sort of like a outdoor gym, which was not really for children or not um, young children, but um, older um, children and adults. And then over here on the right, you see sort of an edge of one of the children's playgrounds. So the creation of playgrounds is a real movement that sweeps through the city and is going on in cities nationwide. But in Central Park, there are no playgrounds until 1928. Um, but I'm showing these two um, images that show how the playground movement does transform Central Park, even though there are no playgrounds. So this is two images of Central Park's iconic sheep meadow, which in the 19th century did have sheep on it. But by the 20th century, I think the sheep were still around, but they were sharing the lawn a lot with these large groups of children. And this was a period in which, um, you know, as part of the playground movement, really, there was all of these organized activities for children. And Central Park really became the stage for these massive um, events, such as folk dancing, um, pageants where people would dress up and reenact different stories, um, and lots of exercise regiments. Um, this is a pretty amazing looking one. Um, Schoolboys all exercising on the sheep meadow and you can see they all have their little areas. It's kind of like a social distancing looking thing almost. Um, so um, this is really a new use and really I would say the first time there are these very large groups of people in Central Park. Uh, this is another image um, showing some girls at the park. Um, a lot of these were being organized for um, immigrant children, especially. Um, but again, this is going on and there's at the time lots of pressure to create new playgrounds, but none of them are happening in Central Park. Um, and that is because there's a lot of pushback. Similar to the arguments earlier in the in the decades earlier about playing sports in the park and keeping off the grass, uh, park advocates and administrators argue that if they start making playgrounds, then the purpose of the park as a respite will be lost. And they also argue if that they keep making, if they start making playgrounds, they'll have to oblige all of these other proposals. So um, this is an illustration that appeared in the New York Times in 1918 that shows what the park would look like if everything that had ever been proposed for it was built. And as you see, there's not a lot of park left. So there was concern that if we start building playgrounds, then it's just gonna open the floodgates to all of these other things. But at the same time, there was growing awareness of the need to better accommodate play for children in Central Park. So in 1928, they create the, the park's first playground, which is in this whole area here. They take off a section of the ball field. So this is the ball field and they um, put a fence around it and, and create this, this purpose built space for children, the first um, one in Central Park. Um, and this is a view of the wading pool that was there.
In the 1930s, the Parks Department, led by Robert Moses, creates a series of 18 playgrounds in Central Park. So this is a very um, momentous occasion and one of the first modern additions to Central Park. The creation of these playgrounds is a great example of how park designers in the 30s were able to integrate these more modern forms of recreation into a 19th century park. What they did was they put the playgrounds all along the perimeter at the edges of the park so that they wouldn't really get in the way of the major landscapes. And what's really remarkable, and you can sort of see it in this picture, is that early on these playgrounds did not have fences or, or big you know, tall fences around them. They had kind of little fences demarcating some of the space. Um, and they were really meant to be more open to the park. That changed over time because of security concerns. But I think it's notable that they were trying to figure out a way to, to balance this use and create um, a sense of these play spaces as being connected to the park. And so what I've tried to show here is that we have the creation of Central Park, which is really what leads to the development of the small parks downtown. But their evolution, and particularly their focus on playgrounds, is what has a really big impact on Central Park. So there's this real reciprocal relationship here. And I'm going to have Jacob take over now, um, who is going to talk more about the small parks and playground movement and how it transformed the Lower East Side. So we're just having some of those technical difficulties that we had foreseen. We'll roll with it in just a second, everybody. Marie, could I ask you to stop screen sharing? It doesn't seem like I can override okay, your PowerPoint. Just did that. There we go. Thank you. All right. Um, I mean, I was quite surprised to sort of hear that Central Park got their playgrounds as late as the 1930s. Um, kind of considering having grown up in New York, I always thought they were just sort of there forever. But what I wanted to start with is this little map. You started, Marie, with sort of a map showing where the Tenement Museum in the Central Park is. I just wanted to highlight a little bit more of sort of the three places that we're going to be talking about today. And the one over here, all the way on the bottom right hand corner, the Tenement Museum is that one in blue. I want to start with. Seward Park. And like you had mentioned, Marie, that uh, Seward Park has sort of is famous for having the first municipally owned and operated playground in 1903. The origins of the playground go back a few more years to about 1899, when uh, there was a group called the Outdoor Recreation League that had started a playground there on essentially what was condemned lots and condemned land. Uh, the ORL was started by two sort of big progressive reformers, Lillian Wald, and Charles B. Stover, Lillian Wilde, of course, founder of the Henry Street Settlement. Then you've got Charles B. Stover tied with the University Settlement Houses. And I think I love that image of the, of the kids playing sort of in the street. Well, I didn't love it, I felt for them. But I think it really underscores what they saw as sort of a necessity for the neighborhood that crowded hallways and tenements, crowded streets were not sort of any place for children to play. And so the ORL, the After Recreation League, eventually winds up operating somewhere like nine playgrounds across New York City. The Parks Department will sort of take over, will we'll take over the duties of the Outdoor Recreation League in 1902, and then about a year later, they'll reopen Seward Park. And this picture that you're looking at over here is this aerial shot of Seward Park. And what Marie was pointing out with sort of those jungle gyms, you've got that ring in the middle of this photograph over here. Now, sort of the features of the new park, we saw some good pictures of them. There were jungle gyms, there was all sorts of athletic apparatuses. There were vaulting bars, there were croquet courts, there were sandboxes. There was a, a bathhouse that was pretty popular, but there were also some pictures of kids going out. There was a fountain just outside the entrance of the, the park itself, shift fountain, that there's a lot of pictures of kids sort of playing in there. And the playgrounds themselves were also divided by gender between boys and girls. And there were different activities that you would find in each. Um, you had stuff like football and baseball, for the boys playground and then you had things like tennis, volleyball, maypoles and the other. And I just want to show this slightly closer image again. You've got that ring in this left sand, left hand side. It looks like you've almost got basketball hoops over here and then you've got some soccer games potentially going on over here. 
No, and I also want to sort of jump onto the idea of thinking about parks as innovative spaces and playgrounds as sort of being innovative and radical spaces. But certainly that's not something that I would often think about when I'm going to a park or a playground that the design of them, the features that are there, were really sort of born out of these debates happening in the early 20th century. And one of the debates, at least sort of for Seward Park, was just sort of simply in the design. Um, in 1902, the Outdoor Recreation League, when their Parks Department is, is deciding to sort of rebuild Seward Park, they propose a design that isn't too dissimilar from today, or in the sense that it had sort of all these playground features. But the Parks Department rejected that initial proposal, citing that it wasn't natural enough. And their design sort of emphasized, I think, a lot of that stuff that we saw with Central Park, the emphasis of sort of nature and recreating that in that space. The Outdoor Recreation League in Stover sort of reject that argument of naturalness by then highlighting that no, it would be unnatural not to sort of have a playground for all of these kids. And the Lower East Side at the time, sort of in the 1900s, by 1903, is probably the densest place on the planet. Uh, you've got densities as high as something upwards of a thousand people per acre. And so I think that really just sort of gives, throws into stark relief just the necessity of the park itself. Um, but underscoring, I think, this discussion of shrub or sandbox, whatever those two were, there was, that, there was a more fundamental sort of discussion about play itself and the significance of it. And that play wasn't just sort of recreational, it was oftentimes framed in some very sort of serious terms, or at the very least, some very sort of civic language. And there's this quote from Teddy Roosevelt in 1907. He was president at the time, he was writing to the Washington Playground Association. And he writes, if we would have our citizens contented and law abiding, we must not sow the seeds of discontent in childhood by denying children their birthright of play. Which is kind of a, it's a big thing. It's a big sort of mission that he's, he's, he's casting out for playgrounds. He does go on to say eventually that you can't just have playgrounds unattended, they had to be supervised because otherwise the point of the recreation is moot which is why we see these two images, at least sort of on the left-hand side, we've got some sort of supervisor, some sort of attendant, and both of the playgrounds in Seward Park were, were monitored by attendants. And the one on the left, you've got a calisthenics, some sort of morning workout, and then you've got those, uh, a game of tennis and volley, or no, excuse me, volleyball going on on the right-hand side over there. I think talking about play though, and talking about the seriousness and the civicness of it, and sort of the necessity of, of good play sort of leading to good citizens, I've got another quote, this time from the Journal of Education in 1913, that frames what happens if you don't have this structured play, if you don't have play done in sort of a proper way. And the, the, the article writes that, aside from bodily injuries, which always do result from free use of apparatus, come the infinitely more serious soul injuries from unrestrained domineering, combative, cowardly, or other bad traits. Which I think the quote itself is fantastic. And so that the fairness and cooperation that you're learning by playing a game of, of baseball or basketball or whatever, exists far past the game itself. And I think the Lower East Side at the time was such a heavily immigrant neighborhood. Uh, a lot of Eastern European immigrants generally coming over from Russia, Austria, Hungary, and Prussia, that perhaps this desire to grow or this desire on structure may have been felt even more sort of necessary. But that wasn't the only way that you could get at this idea of sort of teaching civics to children, nor was it the only way that existed. What you've got here are two images of a park actually in Hill's Kitchen called DeWitt Clinton Park. It was the site of uh, in the beginnings of the children's school farm movement, which was run by a woman named Frances Grissom Parsons, which I know you've written about a lot, Marie. Uh, Seward Park had their own children's school farm. I couldn't unfortunately find any images, but I would just wanted to show these two. On the upper left-hand corner, you've got sort of some crops going on and kids on the bottom right over here tilling soil or digging for whatever they are. Um, and I think, again, that goal is twofold, that you're teaching children horticultural things, agricultural things, things that they would never would get exposure to otherwise, but then through that, you're teaching them these virtues that would be uh, seen as sort of necessary to becoming good Americans and good citizens. And it's this interesting projection of this very rural, agrarian, almost Jeffersonian ideal uh, it's in such sort of an urban place. Uh, Uh, I wasn't able to find any pictures of the sort of the garden itself in Seward Park, but I was able to find uh, a New York Times article describing there apparently was a, a contest that they held in 1927 uh, where they sort of looked at all these plots, they gathered the harvest, and the people that won that had the best cared for plots got some prizes. 
And there was this gentleman, Jonah J. Goldstein from the Eastside Chamber of Commerce, who I think goes a little bit more into this idea of, again, the agricultural ideal, talking about how you, the city boy, now understand better the boy on the farm. Show your gratitude by being good, God-fearing citizens. And again, another quote that I love. Uh, a lot of the groundwork that Seward Park sort of set up in regards to the playground movement, we can sort of see this continuum as we go to our next stop, which is Sarah D. Roosevelt Park, which is about a few blocks west uh, of Seward Park itself. And this is a fantastic image where just about the southern terminus of the park, and we're looking all the way north. You've got the Empire State Building here over on the left. You've got the Chrysler Building just sort of in front of it, and then Central Park itself. I really like that map because you just sort of see the, the distance of it. Now, the park itself was built in 1934, and by the 20s and 30s, the Lower East Side is sort of going through some big changes. It's no longer the densest place sort of on the planet. That's a result of a few things. Part of that is the fact that a lot of older tenements are being raised to construct newer housing. You've got better transportation, so people are sort of simply leaving the neighborhood. And then you don't have new people coming into the neighborhood. This is really sort of a result of a lot of restrictive immigration laws that forbade people it's a long story, but essentially people from Eastern Europe were barred from coming into the United States and the Lower East Side as such a heavily Eastern European immigrant neighborhood is really feeling the effects of that. Um, and when the park is built, it's heralded as sort of America's finest playground, but it wasn't built initially to be a park. In fact, in 1929, the land that the park sits on, it's about seven blocks, something like 7.8 acres, is totally demolished and in its place, there's supposed to be these new sort of modern high-rise apartments, or high-rise, I say, for the 30s. And this is an illustration, it's a rendering of what the park itself, or excuse me, what these apartments were supposed to look like. But of course, 1929, stock market collapse happens that year, the money eventually just sort of dries up or never materializes in the first place. And so what you have is essentially, these buildings are demolished, but nothing's coming in their place. And that lasts for about five years. I wanted to show these two images of the left-hand side and sort of the lower right. The left-hand probably not too long after the demolition of the buildings. This was all just sort of rubble. And on the right-hand side, you've got the park being prepared for uh, construction. And the Parks Department sort of proposes this in 1934 to build a park on the space. And I think to highlight sort of the necessity of green space in the Lower East Side, uh, there was a group called the Regional Planning Association who recommended or who sort of released recommendations about how many how much parkland to residents you should have. And they said that you, had a, you should have about an acre of parkland for every 600 residents. The Lower East Side had about an acre of parkland for every 12,000. So the gulf is kind of hugely dramatic. Uh, the park itself would open to pretty big fanfare in September of 1934. Uh, it was named after the president, then president FDR's mother, Sarah Delano Roosevelt. She herself wasn't in attendance. There was a, a a note about how she, Sarah, wanted the park to be named after Lillian Wald, who we sort of saw was so influential in the design of Seward Park, but we're talking about Sarah D. Roosevelt Park, so that was not too successful uh, of an attempt. And on the left hand, the right hand side, we see again images. You had playgrounds, you had jungle gyms, you even had a wading pool, which is this over here on the right hand side of the image. Now, when it was built, again, SDR Park sort of heralded as America's finest playground, it goes through some difficulties beginning really sort of in the 60s, 70s, and 80s when the entire city is going through a fiscal crisis. And that brings us to our sort of our last stop of the discussion, Mafinda Kalunga, excuse me, Mafinda Kalunga Community Garden, which actually sits on SDR Park. That image we saw was sort of from the southern end of the park, Mafinda Kalunga is just about sort of towards the northern terminus. Now, the history of Mafinda Kalunga really begins in 1982 uh, with something called the Roosevelt Park Community Coalition. They were a group of sort of residents of the Lower East Side who banded together, and then in 1983, they occupied this lot of land. Now, the Lower East Side at the time had a fairly sort of diverse mix of residents. You had a lot of Puerto Rican migrants. You had a pretty substantial immigrant population coming from the Dominican Republic, the different parts of Asia, and then you also had a lot of Black residents calling the Lower East Side home. But like I alluded to just a second ago, it was also a neighborhood sort of suffering the effects of New York's fiscal crisis. And there's not enough time to cover this in any sort of depth that the topic really deserves. But essentially what's beginning to happen is New York City is going bankrupt. It's having problems paying sort of for any of its basic municipal services and neighborhoods are left sort of 
abandoned and left to fend for themselves. And this is an image from the 1980s that I think shows you what the Lower East Side would have looked like. You have a lot of abandoned lots that are happening in the neighborhood. And the people who are left are deciding to reclaim this space on their own and to revitalize a lot of these places. Now today, Mavinda Kalunga has something called green thumb status. And this is actually born out of uh, the fiscal crisis of the 70s and 80s. This was an easy way of essentially a bankrupt city who had a lot of land to be able to, what they essentially did is they recognized all these small community parks as park space without actually having to devote the money towards maintaining them. That this was something that the volunteers did. Uh, there is a bit of a problem that we sort of see happening in the 90s where a lot of these lots are then being sold off as the city gentrifies and as it revitalizes. And what eventually happens is that in 1995, Green Thumb is sort of officially folded into the Parks Department to sort of preserve those spaces even more. There's some stats that say at its height, it had about a thousand community gardens all across New York. Today, it's somewhere between, sort of hovers between five and 600 from what I've been able to find. But I think even just ignoring the legalistic mechanisms that preserve these spaces, it really kind of comes down to, I think, the people who maintain this garden on a daily basis. And I think certainly this discussion of, of of reclamation of space and the sort of civic resident activism, I think does have a lot of certainly comparisons to today of people sort of reclaiming space in light of all the protests that have been going on as we maybe participate or as I think just we sort of broadly witness um, all of the movements sort of for racial justice. Now the images that I've got on the screen in front of you now uh, our images sort of of Mifinda Kalunga present day, they've got about 50 gardeners all together, or 50 volunteers who take care of it, all sort of the horticultural, agricultural, all the plants, all the trees, everything. You might also notice there's a rooster on the right hand side. Uh, they have both a chicken coop and a turtle pond at the park itself. Uh, in addition to this, they also host events, there's programming, they do sort of, um, they have relationships with a lot of the institutions around the neighborhood itself. And so, I think from Central Park to Seward Park to SDR to move into Kalunga, we're seeing that sort of this narrative about park space doesn't live in isolation. I think I just really want to highlight again that reciprocal nature um, of a space that's sort of as big as Central Park influencing the small parks and then having that feedback into that. Um, which I'm going to bring you back sort of Marie to, to perhaps give some sort of closing statements before we open it up a little bit. Let me stop my share. Okay, I'm just getting my closing statements together. So part of the reason we came up with this program is because the pandemic has really made people appreciate their open spaces and parks in new ways. And I'm hopeful that we were able to heighten this appreciation by talking about how they came to be and how they've evolved and how they've influenced one another. And I wanna end with a few um, images to, and talking a little bit about how the pandemic has impacted Central Park. Cause I think, you know, what's really interesting about the history of the parks is also how they are so informed by everything that's going on in the city. And you saw Jacob's photos of the fiscal crisis and how that really leads um, the abandonment really of these spaces leads to um, the creation of community gardens. And so all of these spaces, they're not isolated. They're always being informed by the events of the city. And what's been really remarkable in Central Park in the past few months is that, you know, there's fewer people without all the tourists. There's a lot fewer activities. Uh, the playgrounds are closed, events are canceled. There's no team sports. But what you have is actually the park kind of distilled to its essential purpose as a respite from the city and an experience of nature. That's really all there is to do in the park. And people have been really remarking on how much the park has meant to them during this time as a sanctuary and a place to go to escape what's going on and escape their homes. And these photos show that despite everything that was happening this spring, it was still one of the most beautiful springs. During the past few weeks, we've also seen new forms of appreciation and reclamation of public space. 
as our parks and streets and bridges have become spaces for protest and gathering and marching and mourning. And even in this very short time, we've seen these even larger kind of more physical transformations or more permanent um, additions that are marking this movement. And it's, I've been really struck by this image and, and some of the murals that we've been seeing and how this is really kind of irre irrevocably transforming our um, public spaces. And this is a very important part of the history of public spaces. And I think it's important to acknowledge that. Um, and so reflecting, on the role and meaning of public space right now, I'm drawn back to the purpose of Central Park, which, you know, this, it wasn't a place for protest during the 19th century, but it really embodies some foundational ideas about the meaning of urban community that I think are very important to think about right now. Central Park was built on the premise that living in cities was unhealthy and had dehumanizing effects on people. And that being together in a more beautiful and natural and healthy environment with opportunities to gather, to exercise, to be in nature, all of those things would help alleviate the dehumanizing effects of cities. And Olmsted and other park advocates and civic leaders really emphasize that all urban dwellers should have access to parks, that they should be open to everybody and really argued that this was critical to the success of the city because being in these spaces was what really restored people to a common humanity. It, it's what made people nicer to each other and um, happier. And I want to acknowledge that equal access to open space and nature is, is an ideal that still has not been totally achieved in all our cities and needs more work. But I think it's important to recognize that a lot of this thinking about it really comes from the early days of these parks and Central Park and then also um, the small parks that Jacob has been talking about and sort of creating access to playgrounds for children as being something all children deserved a place to play. And while Olmsted wrote a lot about tranquility and respite, he also wrote a lot about the joy he found in watching crowds of people in the park and the joy he observed them experiencing in the park. He talks about groups of people, and this is some quotes from him, with an evident glee in the prospect of coming together and how he sees all classes largely represented with a common purpose. He talks about how they're not intellectual, they're not competitive, they're not jealous in this, when they're in the park. <laughs> and he observes that they're there on the same terms. They're all there to enjoy the park. And he concludes this one particular passage by saying each individual adding by his mere presence to the pleasures of all others all helping to the greater happiness of each. And I think that's just an important message to think about that, you know, related to all the things that are going on, that we're all kind of here to help each other and being in nature and, and being in parks is important for our um, sense of community. So thank you. I think we're gonna go to a little Q and A with, Jacob. Yeah, Jacob can come back on. I want to be really mindful. First off, I want to thank Marie and Jacob uh, so much for the information, for um, walking us through what's a really exciting history and one that, uh, with a presentation that raised a lot of really great questions, um, that raised a lot of topics that people sound like they would like to continue to explore, including the, you know, um, the, the farm movement, including uh, the parks movement in general. And I also want to recognize that this is a 45 minute program and we are now over time. <laughs> uh, so what I'd like to end with actually um, is, is one question uh, for Marie and Jacob. Um, uh, I would love it if you wouldn't mind just sharing um, what your local park is and how your appreciation of it might have changed in the last you know, three months or, or two weeks. Um, and then I've got a closing remark or two uh, and then we'll go ahead and sign off. Jacob, do you want to go first? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, so I'm in Hell's Kitchen myself, so I'm not too far away when we saw those images of the children's school farm um, in DeWitt Clinton Park. That's not too far away from where I am. That's not too far away from where I went to college. That was oftentimes a place I would sort of ride by. Um, every October, there's uh, It's My Park Day, which you sort of volunteer, plant, clean stuff up. And so I remember doing that a few times. And so now I sort of taking walks uh, I've gone there a few times and I think sort of a, 
had a little bit more space time to appreciate that. There's a great um, Doughboy monument to the First World War, which I enjoy. Uh, I've also been making a lot of use. I'm not too far away from the water, so I go sort of on the Hudson River Greenway, I guess, up and down. I like to ride my bike there. And then I was also shocked to learn, or surprised to learn, not shocked, it wasn't that big of a personal shock, was that there's a park not too far away in Chelsea that is named after the guy who wrote, not The Nightmare Before Christmas, um, Twas the Night Before Christmas, Clement Clark Moore. Clement Clark Moore, yeah. And so I think, yeah, just sort of an appreciation of maybe the smaller spaces that I would have walked by without giving too much of a thought. Yeah, that's great. It sounds like you've been doing a lot of exploring. I think that it has been really interesting to be a little more focused on the things that we have access to and that are close to us that we may overlook or maybe just go to once in a while on a weekend. Um, I live close to Prospect Park and it's been really interesting to be exploring that a little bit more and thinking about, you know, we're talking about relationships between parks and thinking a lot about the relationship between these two parks. Um, and also really seeing people enjoy the park so much has been really inspiring. Um, just again, the way it's been this kind of respite and sanctuary for people. And then the other place I've been visiting is not a park, but a cemetery, Greenwood Cemetery, Ooh. which is a really remarkable space that um, I highly recommend if you're able to. Um, it's really, really beautiful. And it's also interesting because you can't um, walk dogs there, you can't jog. Um, you really can just walk around you're not supposed to picnic. Um, and so you really do get a sense of, um, and it's a longer story, but Greenwood Cemetery was influential in the development of Central Park and the design of Central Park. Um, and so again, that's another place I've been thinking a lot about connections between these other green spaces. So yeah, I feel very lucky to live near these green spaces and I have definitely appreciated them more. Great, thank you very much to you both. I now invite you to wave goodbye and turn off your cameras and your mic. <laughs> thank you for coming. Thank you everyone today. for coming. Uh, I want to thank all of you for joining us today uh, and especially again to thank Marie and Jacob for their contributions to the discussion. Um, both the Tenement Museum and the Conservancy have a slate of virtual programs and we encourage you to check them out. Uh, you can find the Central Park Conservancies on our website at centralparknyc.org and the Tenement Museums on their website which is tenement.org. Uh, in addition, I want to take a moment to acknowledge a really dire situation that cultural institutions are finding themselves in right now. Um, we have been in parks because we can't be other places. And so if you have the means, please consider making a donation to either the Conservancy or the Tenement Museum, uh, however small, just to help um, us all continue our work. Um, the last thing, there's so many questions about resources and people wanting to learn more. And so what I'm going to pledge right now, and you can hold me to it because this is recording, um, in a follow-up email that we will send, we'll add uh, three or four additional resources where you can go to look for more information uh, on some of the topics that we were raised today. So we will have more of these programs in the future. Please stay tuned. But from the Central Park Conservancy and the Tenement Museum, stay safe and be well.